Uh, pediatric upper extremity injuries are, they, they really range the gamut of routine, straightforward, I know what to do with these things, to the more thinker things that need, need more investigation. So today I want to focus on the things that you could feel comfortably taking care of on your own and things that you'll want to get more help with. Pediatric uh, fracture basics. Uh, we remember the mnemonic that we've been trying to space repetition into your brain is the SNAG mnemonic, right? We look to see whether or not the skin is intact, whether there are any neurovascular changes, whether there is, are there any signs of abuse, and what's going on with the growth plate. The motto for children, what is their motto? Play or die, <laughs> right? They don't care about anything else. They just want to keep going, right? They got things to do. They, they don't want to sit there and go, I have an ouchie. They, they just want to keep going. So if they have a musculoskeletal complaint, then film it. They have fragile growth plates. They have sort of a hard gelatin of a growth plate that's very easily disrupted. So just keep that in, in mind in the terms of abuse, but also just in the wear and tear of what it is to be a child running around all over the place. Okay, should we reduce these acutely? And some of these fractures, yes. Some of them you have a little bit of time if they are severely angulated, right? What's another thing that might make you want to quickly reduce this really mangled extremity? Vascular compromise. So you check those pulses and make sure that you have a nice normal pulse on both sides. You know, numbness and tingling. What's another thing? I think I might have heard it over here. Skin tenting is another thing, right? That tenting of the skin, you're blanching that skin, you're putting that skin at risk for ischemia, necrosis, and potential, potentially converting this fracture into an open fracture, which automatically means an operative approach as opposed to a closed reduction. So you wanna keep people's options open while you see them as well. You don't wanna make it worse. This is a little bit of a shout out to the fact that of, kid, of course kids remodel very well. Uh, this type of reduction, you know, uh, the place where I would work would not be what we would say is the goal, but even in something where, who knows, they, maybe they weren't able to get these two little chicken wing bones together, right? If, try to imagine in multiple dimensions, trying to get two points together at the same time, it's not going to be perfect. But even when you have a reduction that is not ideal, over time, the osteoclasts will break up the dead bone and the osteoblast will lay down new bone and slowly over time, biomechanically, you'll right yourself. And a few years later, you see this beautiful, uh, beautiful um, healing. So how bad is angulated? In general, 20 degrees on the lateral view and 10 degrees on the AP view. You can look at different references. It's hard to keep numbers in your mind sometimes, but there are, the most important thing I think to remember here is that there are criteria. There are plenty of online resources that you can look for to try to refresh your memory. A torus buccal fracture, remember torus is an architectural term, it's that it's the little lip at the end of at the bottom of columns. And you can see that these fractures, if, if compare and contrast, the fractures I just showed you before were pretty gnarly and they healed. This is like barely a fracture. Is it gonna heal? Yes, it will. So it's very stable, has a good prognosis. Splint and refer is just fine. Plastic deformation. This is kind of uh, taking advantage of the child's elasticity. They bend more than they break, right? Because they have very rich collagen reserves in their bones, but they haven't mineralized yet. So they bend, 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 and then break, which is great in general, except if they only bend to a point where they look like a boat right there, then there can be trouble. So there is a limit to it, and about 20% angulation for these plastic deformation fractures is important to keep in mind, right? A little bit of bend is okay. Some of these that are very bow-like, they won't have the, um, it'll, uh, they don't have the fracture to uh, initiate a healing response. They just have a now bent, uh, bone, which is kind of like how you do horticulture where you train vines and things like that, it may stay close to that if we don't do something about it. Green stick fractures are named, of course, after um, water containing branches where they'll bend, 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 and just break on one side. The nice thing about these is when you see them in the emergency department or otherwise acutely in the field or what have you, is that you still have one, uh, one surface of the cortex and the periosteum intact, and you can use that as a leverage when you're trying to reduce these fractures. So it's, they're, they're a nice fracture to have if you have to go from torus to green stick to actual complete uh, fracture through both cortices. 
Growth plates, this is where really the rubber hits the road. And like I say, you know, we talk about radiation exposure in children. X-rays are not a big deal. And if there's a possibility of a fracture, X-ray them. If they have a growth plate, X-ray them. That's my, that's my mantra. Uh, you know, it's amazing how, how we are, how we're formed, right? We have our diaphysis here, our shaft. We have our metaphysis. We have our physis, which is the growth plate, and then our epiphysis, right? And the reason why we have the physis, the growth plate, between the epiphysis and the rest of the bone is to protect that growth plate. It's kind of like an Oreo cookie, right? You have like biscuit on both sides. You have cookie on both sides and the Oreo filling that's fragile. If you had Oreo on the outside, if you had the double stuff only on the outside, it would smear all over the place, right? So the, the idea behind that is to protect the growth plate so that it grows from the inside out. That's just how Mother Nature is taking good care of us. But we have to remember that that can be fractured, can be, can be uh, disrupted as well. And if that growth plate is asymmetrically uh, disrupted, then it's going to grow in a weird way. It's either not going to grow at all because it's been now crushed, or you'll have some odd asymmetry to the growth pattern. So protect those growth plates, which is why we learn the Salter-Harris classification. You've all seen this a million times, but let's just refresh our memories. Remember that, so this, this was done um, many years ago by Salter and Harris. They uh, try to figure out, well, what are the typical predictable patterns of fracture? And they broke the bones of these little bunnies, these little immature bunnies, it's very sad, and they found these fracture pattern, patterns. So the poor bunnies had to suffer, but we can benefit from them uh, by using this Salter classification, right? Type 1, S-A-L-T-E-R, and the, the helpful thing about this is that as you go through the types from 1 to 5, that is a more severe fracture, more severe injury, it needs more intervention. Remember that when you are talking to an orthopedist over the phone, many times they won't have the films, they might not be in your same system, they might not have the EMR in front of them, so it's important to be able to have that good descriptive um, uh, communication with them. We always have an orientation of the uh, epiphysis downward, right? So you're gonna see you know, these growth plates in different orientations. Just remember the epiphysis is always down when we use this, and we use the S for straight across or slip, and this is really minimal movement, and these do very well with just closed reduction. A is above, meaning this um, thurman holster fracture, this little remnant is above the growth plate, and these are a bit more stable. You can see how the growth plate is still intact, the fullness of the growth plate is intact, but that little frag fracture fragment may disrupt it. Most of the time, these are also closed reduction. Type three has gone through the growth plate, and now we really have to ask ourselves, is it so disruptive that it's going to be a problem in future growth? And the orthopods use different types of things. You talk to one orthopod, you'll get three different answers, right? Uh, but uh, if it's more than two millimeters uh, lag between the two pieces of bone, then that's another indication for an operative management for type threes. Uh, type fours almost always get intervened on. You can see this is really an unstable fracture in relation to the growth plate, and type four is a total crush of the growth plate, and unless they go out and reconstruct, uh, then this child will have a growth arrest. So worse as it gets further, and just remember the orientation, the epiphysis is down when you're trying to remember the orientation and then what the categorization is. Abuse fractures. We talked a little bit about this throughout the past two days, but remember that any long bone fractures in somebody who can't walk, doesn't make sense. Spiral long bone fractures, especially in femurs, are, are bad. They usually are bad. Again, it's in the context of what's going on with the, with the, whole, um, the whole presentation. Metaphyseal corner fractures, these buccal ha handle fractures, are pretty much pathognomonic. They're very few, you talk to child abuse experts and they'll say there are very few things that are pathognomonic, and that's true. But this is one of the more pathognomonic fractures. Anything on the sternum, scapula, spinous process, you think what is a normal infant, toddler, preschooler doing that's gonna cause that? And unless there's a, a really good reason for it, you need to consider abuse. And then multiple fractures, of course. So this is just to kind of uh, sear into your mind things. If you just see this and go, oh no, something's wrong, right? A spiral fracture in a little baby in diapers, bad. You see a bucket handle fracture there in the upper left. Any of these posterior rib fractures are pretty much abuse until proven otherwise. And then another bucket, bucket handle fracture you see here. Excuse me just a moment. <clears throat> okay, so as you can see, this has been studied for multiple decades and certain fracture patterns, the 
child abuse experts will use to determine whether or not more investigation is needed. Other abuse fractures, as we see here, um, spiral. There is also this deformation here, almost like a torus fracture in the lower left. In a baby in the upper extremity, why, why would this happen? They're not lifting anything that heavy. They're not running anywhere. They're not able to really run out on, a, on an outstretched hand. Clavicle fractures, when you're first born, sure, you can have a clavicular fracture during birth trauma, but that is almost always diagnosed at birth. These are later on what can happen. Think about the context, but for the most part, it's falling laterally or falling off a bike or what have you. The distal one-third, those are pretty safe fractures. The proximal one-third, you have to wonder, is there a mediastinal involvement? And again, even in um, motor vehicle accidents, et cetera, chest trauma in children is rare, but if you see a child who was restrained, has a clavicular fracture in the proximal third, think about are the great vessels damaged? And then of course we uh, should get a consult if there's an open fracture, there's a tenting of the skin. This is very rare for clavicular fractures. The uh, very fancy figure of eight uh, dressings for clavicular fractures are really not recommended anymore. The idea is just to try to help them with their pain, and that might be just a sling, but to try to get out of that sling as soon as possible because you want to make sure they don't develop adhesive capsulitis, a frozen shoulder. It's more of an adolescent adult thing, but less is more with these types of very stable fractures. Proximal humus, humerus fractures uh, can happen sometimes when you have a unicameral uh, cyst, you have an osteochondroma, you have some kind of pathologic fracture that is a benign growth, uh, but again, think about why this happened. Always, whenever you're looking at these uh, proximal humerus fractures, you want to make sure that the axillary nerve is intact, both by sensation and try to do motor. How do you do that practically? Pain control, that'll take a lot of the cream off the crop, make them feel better, make your exam more accurate. Can you feel this? Can you feel this? Is this the same? And if you get them to fire their axillary at all, their deltoid at all, then they're probably intact. Neonatal humerus fractures, um, this again could happen with anything, but you know, they, uh, abuse is always on the spectrum. They'll typically, the, the parents will typically say, every time I change his or her diaper, uh, his or her clothes, I have to pull up the arm and they, they, they're fussy, they cry. Think about that. And this is also just a good plug for any time you see uh, a pre-ambulatory child in an acute setting, we don't know what happened to them. Do a thorough head-to-toe exam. Most children don't have 30 years of diabetes, hypertension, and cholesterolemia complications that you have to do a long list of all of their past medical history. Really, their history is on their body. Use that and look at every surf, every little nook and cranny, range every joint, and make sure that it all works out. Because just because the good, kind, caring caregiver that's there with you hasn't hurt the child. We don't know what else has been, uh, who else has been in contact. Humerus, uh, uh, head of the humerus and the physis of the humerus uh, is, inter is an interesting type of thing. The humerus and the shoulder joint can do anything, right? It can do circumduction, abduction, adduction, flexion, extension. And so in that way, the growth plate has to be a little tougher. It's sort of a tortoise in the hair type of thing. It's the tortoise of growth plates. It takes a long time to finally fuse because it's constantly being stressed. And it's usually a little more stable than the hinge joints. Like if you, if you have one of the hinge joints that, uh, um, where the growth plate is disrupted, that has been some other force that the hinge joint is not designed to do, some kind of torsion or uh, some kind of axial load. In this case, though, it takes a long time for the physis in the humerus to heal, and that's normal. You'll see adolescents with growth plates all the time, and that's just fine. We often will uh, swath them here. You know, interesting thing about humerus fractures is that they all do well. You have gravity is basically your immobilizer. So the, the old joke is, you know, when you talk about humerus fractures, as long as the two fracture fragments are in the same zip code, they'll heal. In other words, over time, those two pieces of fracture fragment come together, ca will cause a, a callus. Gravity is your friend, and you don't necessarily need to be immobilized for a long period of time. 
Oh, okay, we talked about that. There, again, angulation, it's very rare to intervene on these. Uh, and again, if we've, on plain films, if we find something suspicious, like a growth that we weren't expecting, we may need to investigate that. Mid-shaft humeral fractures, again, uncommon. Uh, think about pathological fractures we talked about, about, and neurovascular injury in these cases is rare. Uh, Dr. Iyer will talk about later on supracondylar fractures as a type of Fouche injury. Some of these can also be fall on an outstretched hand. Upper extremity innervation, you know, it's hard to remember these things. This is fine to have a reference uh, as, as well as this, but I just want to show you something that might be helpful uh, when you're doing your physical exam. So anyone who wants to partake, you can put your, this is the um, interactive portion of the day. Uh, you can take your hands out like this. We're going to fire C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1, right? So we're going to do flexion here of the biceps. We're going to do extension of the wrist, extension of the elbows, flexion of the fingers, and abduction. All right, so everybody, whoever wants to do this, I feel like I'm a showgirl up here. All right, ready? <laughs> C5, C6, C7, C8, T1. You don't want to see that. Anyways, um, <laughs> follow up. Follow up with these types of fractures, you know, seven to 10 days is just fine. You know, urgent, emergent, I think in different specialties are, mean different things. To us, emergent means like right now, the next few minutes to hours. Uh, emergent in the orthopedic world is within the next three to five days, and urgent is within the next one to two weeks. So, uh, you know, they have a slightly different sense of things, which can help us because when we see somebody as non-orthopedist, there's gonna be a lag time because of the appointments that need to be made, because maybe they need to go through their primary care doctor and need to be referral, all those things. So I tell people, you know, uh, what is today is Thursday, right? So if this happened today, I'd say, wow, Right now, right after this appointment, call your physician and make an appointment. If it's Saturday, I say Monday at 8 o'clock in the discharge instruction, 8 o'clock, call your physician to do this, to make an appointment. Make it very clear that the squeaky wheel gets the grease, and once they're out of your purview in the acute setting, they have to kind of pull it uh, forward from them. And if they're in your healthcare system, it's a very kind thing to make that appointment if you can do that for them. But we have a little bit of buffer time. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit. We have a little bit of time because I was a bit of a motor mouth right now um, ab <laughs> about just fractures in general. It is such a uh, frightening thing to everyone, right? And their, first, uh, their other first question is, you know, is it broken or is it fractured? And you can explain there's no difference, of course. Uh, but I think going through the films with them can be very helpful. Just to get a sense, I, I know this sounds very obvious and I know a lot of you do it and it takes some time to pull things up, but you can tell when you're connecting with a patient and their family, you know, if, if they've been through this, they've had all the other kids in the family have sports injuries, they understand, that's great, not a problem. But there are, you can get that sense of that deer in the headlights, you know, don't even ask them, just pull up the films and show this is what's going on, this is our goal for a little Johnny or a little Susie, and these are the next steps. And I think by laying it out on the table and showing step by step, that's where the real, where the real questions come in, as opposed to, do you have any questions? What's the first answer gonna be? Uh, no, but how about what questions do you have? And that invites people to say, of course you have questions, so tell me what I can do to help you, help you make your life easier in the next few days. Here's analgesia, all the multimodal things we can do as far as ice, immobilization, rest. It seems very obvious to us, and it's probably obvious to them on a good day, but take a moment just to guide them through. People love to be guided through things, right? Especially when it's stressful, and take that moment with them. So with that, I will end this, and we'll talk a little bit more uh, after the break.